All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Jack Dufresne. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you this morning. Um, I'm a student of Lama Jempa's, and I have been since end of 2018, um, and I took refuge in March of 2019. And I can say that um, my practice since taking refuge uh, has totally transformed my life and the way I think about everything, the way I do things. Um, and so that might come up a little bit in today's topic, but um, yeah, we're going to be talking about harm reduction today. Um, and folks might not know what harm reduction is. We're going to, I'm going to introduce it a little bit um, and then also compare it to the Buddhist path. So we're kind of going to get into a lot. Um, this is a huge topic, so I know we're not going to cover everything, um, but yeah, we're going to, we're going to start. So my resources for this talk, um, Lama as usual, uh, we do our, our darshans where we can talk about, you know, many different topics. Um, and he's had a lot of experience doing substance use uh, counseling. So um, he's been helpful for this talk. Um, another person who's been a very strong mentor for me um, in harm reduction and substance use counseling has been Dr. Susan Collins. And she is the director of um, this harm reduction research uh, and treatment center um, at the, the UW, University of Washington. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a taste of Susan's compassion for people who use substances, um, in a training that I did with her, she was talking about how this young man had come in um, who had been using heroin um, off and on for quite a long time. And um, he mentioned, you know, kind of in shame, like, um, you know, I was shooting up the other day and I was using uh, the water from the top of the, the toilet. <laughs> like, um, and she was like, her response was, um, I am so proud of you for choosing to use the water at the top of the toilet rather than the toilet bowl. <laughs> so that's the kind of like compassion that we're talking about, like really, really finding any positive step. Um, also, the National Harm Reduction Coalition is an excellent organization, um, and I recommend you looking into them if you're interested in this topic. Um, so the title of the, the talk today is Harm Reduction and Buddhism rejoicing in any step towards positive change. And so you can kind of hear um, from my example from Susan is that, you know, we're really encouraging people to take a look at their substance use and see if there's any way that they can do so um, in a safer manner, to, to use substances in a safer manner. That includes quitting completely and it includes other safer use strategies that we're gonna talk about a little bit. Um, and then, of course, on the path, uh, we have this incredible Buddhist path um, where we are not yet fully enlightened, right? And so we are going to be engaging um, in harmful behavior or, you know, uh, somewhat harmful behavior. Um, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more. Um, also, no, please, if you are currently dealing with addiction, we want you here. You know, like we, we, accept you, we accept where you're at with that. Um, and so even though there's those of us who have taken refuge, who have committed to um, refraining from substances, that doesn't mean that you're not welcome here if you're struggling with addiction. We want you here. Also, if, if you are a refuge student and you're struggling with substance use, please reach out to folks. Um, you know, we don't need to keep this like underneath a blanket of shame, you know, like let's let's get you know out from underneath that um, and connect with one another. So that's kind of um, a little bit about the talk, and now a little bit about myself, um, why I'm talking about this. Um, so I am a peer counselor at Harborview Medical Center um, in Seattle, and in that job. I work on the, um, the psychiatric units and I meet a ton of people um, who are dealing with both mental health challenges and substance use challenges at the same time. Um, in fact, oftentimes I would say that that combination is more common than not. Um, 
the mission of Harborview, <clears throat> excuse me, is to really support all those people who might have a difficult time getting in for medical care. Maybe um, they're living on the streets, they're uninsured, underinsured, um, they might even be incarcerated. So there's a lot of people, especially on the psychiatric kind of side of things, who are dealing with very major, very impacting um, social circumstances. So when we're talking about substance use, we wanna consider the whole context of the person. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, on the psychiatric unit, in addition to one-on-one -on -one kind of support, um, I facilitate groups and actually recently started a harm reduction group where people can get together, they can talk about their substance use, they can explore if at all they want to change anything around their use and get some ideas from folks on how to get started. So that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm happy that, that that's a, a new thing at Harborview. Um, I'm also really lucky in my job because it's such like the perfect opportunity to develop bodhicitta um, just because sometimes, and, and I'm sure, you know, other people in the room might feel this as well. You see people behaving in ways that to us, to me, don't, doesn't make sense, right? I'm kind of like, why would you continue to use meth when you've just lost your children because of meth use, you know, you're losing your house. You're in the psych ward, but you're talking about going out to use meth again. Like, what's going on? So we really have to take a look at, yeah, what is going on? What is the context um, of this person? And so I really am super fortunate that I get to work with um, these incredible folks um, who are really dealing with some of the worst circumstances in our world, um, because then I get to develop bodhicitta and hopefully be of some use to these folks. And the most important thing to remember when we're facing people who are engaging in behaviors that we don't understand or that maybe are disturbing to us um, is that every single one of those people has Buddha nature and are completely capable of liberation. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about what is harm reduction in general. And if you notice, I'm kind of like turning from side to side because on one side of my screen is you guys and then on one side of the screen is like the camera. So like, it's kind of confusing, but hopefully it works fine. Um, so I'm gonna read for you and I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Can folks see it? Okay. Great. So this is the National Harm Reduction's eight central practices um, for basically initiating harm reduction with people and in our community. So number one, harm reduction approach accepts for better or for worse, that licit and illicit drug use is part of our world and chooses to work to minimize its harmful effects rather than simply ignore or condemn them. Number two, understands drug use as a complex multifaceted phenomenon that encompasses a continuum of behaviors from severe use to total abstinence and acknowledges that some ways of using drugs are clearly safer than others. Number three, establishes quality of individual and community life and well being, not necessarily cessation of all drug use, as the criteria for successful interventions and policies. Four, calls for the non judgmental, non coercive provision of services and resources to people who use drugs and the communities in which they live in order to assist them in reducing attendant harm. Five, ensures that people who use drugs and those with a history of drug use routinely have a real voice in the creation of programs and policies designed to serve them. Six, affirms people who use drugs themselves as the primary agents of reducing the harms of their drug use and seeks to empower people who use drugs to share information and support each other in strategies which meet their actual conditions of use. Seven, recognizes that the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, sex-based discrimination, and other social inequalities affect both people's vulnerability to and capacity for effectively dealing with drug-related harm. Eight, 
does not attempt to minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm and danger that can be associated with illicit drug use. So thanks for going through those with me. I think they're just a good kind of way to set the foundation for what we're looking at. Um, so in general, the kind of definition of harm reduction is that it's a public health strategy to address substance-related harm. Um, so it's not necessarily about getting people towards abstinence, though that is part of harm reduction, but it's about finding ways that people can reduce the most extreme types of harm, such as overdose, right, which can cause death. Um, many types of wounds, right? I've seen incredible types of wounds at hospital from substance use. Victimization, incarceration, right? So we're trying to find ways to reduce the likelihood that those are gonna happen. And what's interesting is that harm reduction actually started as a grassroots movement um, of intravenous drug users and folks with HIV um, in order to prevent the spread of HIV and other infectious diseases. Um, and I find it really interesting that there's this relationship there between marginalized identities, so people who use substances and people, you know, at, in the beginning of the, the AIDS crisis, majority folks who were gay, right? So there's this kind of like um, relationship between different marginalized identities and the risk for substance use itself and substance use related harm. Now that doesn't mean that substance use doesn't affect communities that have more privilege. Um, it certainly does happen. We know that you know people with wealth use substances as well. However, their risk for harm, um, such as incarceration or overdose, um, lack of access to medical care, those things aren't gonna be as much of a, a problem as those who maybe don't have access um, to that kind of care. So harm reduction is also a range of safer use practices, right? So we talked about reducing the chance of overdose, reducing the chance of getting HIV. And so because of that, people largely think of like safe needle exchange, um, which is a wonderful harm reduction um, uh, aspect of harm reduction, but there's more to it. So um, we're really looking at like, what are some of the systemic causes of substance use and harm rather than solely the individual? Um, <clears throat> so it's a little bit different from kind of like the 12 step model, right? Um, where we're asking people just to, to drop uh, their addiction. Um, and it's also different from mandatory treatment. So we're not forcing people, we're not saying, um, your life has become out of control. You need to be in a place where we can get you in control, right? So it's it's a little bit, it's different. But one thing that I really want to encourage people to consider is that just like there's all these different approaches to teaching the Dharma, there's just as many approaches for dealing with addiction and substance use. That being that it is an individual um, you know, approach. So some people are gonna do really, really, really well with 12 step. And some people might need <laughs> uh, to be in involuntary treatment for them to kind of get somewhere with their substance use. But I have tended to see that um, this kind of non-coercive approach of harm reduction can be really validating for people so that they can know like, okay, I can make choices about my life I have self-efficacy, right? I can do this. Um, whereas sometimes with the kind of um, mandatory treatment, involuntary treatment approach, that still leaves people in a place of feeling hopeless because then someone else is doing it for them, right? Um, and I have to say there's, <laughs> in my work, there's, there's plenty of people that um, I can think of that I would rather they be detained right now. <laughs> like to to keep them from harm, to keep them safe. There's this paternalistic part of me that's like, I just want to put like those really young women, the young queer folks like who are dealing with substance use, I just want to put them in a safe place 
so they can like get what they need and then then go on their way but the problem is is like we can't detain everybody right who's dealing with substance use and we can't detain all of their abusers right that you know and all of the the people who um are selling substances for various reasons um for one, it's extremely expensive, right? These systems of incarceration, um, the war on drugs has been extremely expensive. And for two, it doesn't seem to be very effective, does it? We still have this major problem. Um, and also it's traumatizing. It's traumatizing for people. So it kind of sometimes can reinforce the shame and stigma spiral that then leads people to use more. So I think one of the things I really love about harm reduction is that it's a non-carceral approach to substance use. We're gonna try and find other ways to approach the harm that people have been experiencing so that we don't have to just lock them away, right? <laughs> so when we think about substance use, we're kind of thinking about different ranges of use. So it can range from just kind of simple use um, to misuse and abuse. For refuge students, um, we've decided that actually any use is going to be harmful. Um, and that's because we're being, we're, we're using something to kind of like get out of our normal state of mind when actually there's, there's no, nothing to get to, right? Like, um, there, there's actually no escape. And so a lot of times we're using substances because we want to just have a little escape even if it's just on the kind of like simple use side of things. Um, and so there's all these different, you know, the spectrum of use. For example, like when we think about people who just go out and maybe have like a drink with friend, a friend or like a glass of wine with dinner, that's maybe kind of like just simple use. Then there's misuse. Maybe like when you go out, you have like, eight drinks, you know, and you're doing that maybe a few times a month or something. And then there's abuse that gets to the point of like dependency. So that's where you might need alcohol throughout the day, you're waking up and having alcohol. Um, and in the harm reduction approach, we say that no matter where you're at, at on that use spectrum, everyone deserves healthier and happier lives, you know, whether you're just using recreationally, or you're in active addiction. Um, so some example of that, let, let's say, um, we're, you know, looking at safer use strategies for people along that spectrum. So for someone who's just kind of using rec recreationally, like going out and having a drink with friends, one kind of safer use strategy is that you'd want to make sure and have a designated driver, right? That's, that's one way to keep yourself safe. Um, then kind of like going up to the, the misuse category. Maybe you're, you're binge drinking a few times a month or a week. Um, maybe a safer use strategy could be that you start to count your drinks. And when you get to a certain point, maybe like six drinks, you're cutting yourself off. Um, I've actually heard of one guy who, he was a big time beer drinker, and he would keep um, his beer tabs in his pocket so he could count. And when he reached a certain point, he'd be like, okay, no more. Um, and then a safer use strategy for like extreme use addiction um, is, okay, how about we work out when you're gonna start drinking in the day? So maybe instead of starting at 9 a.m. when you wake up, how about you start at noon? And then just kind of like gradually, you know, working on that. So you can see there's like all these different ways that we can work with substance use and make sure that people are safe wherever they're at. And I mentioned um, a little bit earlier that not all people suffer substance-related harm when they use substances. Um, and of course, for folks who have taken refuge, we say that actually, yes, even if you're just having a glass of wine, there's some harm there, right? Because you're trying, you're trying to escape what, what doesn't actually need escaping. But for the rest of like the general public, um, we're saying that, you know, maybe a glass of wine isn't going to, to harm most people. Um, but we start to suffer substance-related harm um, when we start to experience consequences because of our use. 
And for some people, they could actually drink maybe or use something quite a bit, but not necessarily experience a ton of harm. So maybe there's someone who's still able to go to work, have a high paying job, um, you know, have a family, um, but they're maybe still using some kind of substance. Um, and then there's other people who maybe could use less than that person and experience a lot of harm. So again, it's extremely individual. And there's research that shows there's higher incidence of substance-related harm um, amongst people who live in marginalized communities. So that's folks who um, are experiencing poverty, um, people who are experiencing racism, uh, transphobia, homophobia, that there's going to be um, higher instances where the use of substances are going to lead to some kind of harmful consequence. And sometimes that's because those communities are more heavily policed. So there's more of a likelihood that someone's going to get pulled over or you know, apprehended because of their substance use if they're from a community that is more heavily policed. Um, it might be that trauma, experiences of trauma from being marginalized are going to lead to types of excuse me, use that is more harmful or dangerous. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and one thing that's related to that is that, you know, this approach of harm reduction where we're looking at what's happening individually um, with, uh, with people um, is that we see that there's this very contextual and interdependent um, aspect of substance use. There's many different things going on. There's many factors. Um, and in our kind of like medical um, world, uh, Western world, we tend to place blame for substance use on the individual. So we kind of, you know, there's this spectrum of like, okay, it's an, an organic illness with genetic predispositions. Um, that's at its best. <laughs> And then at its worst, it's seen as like a moral failure of the individual, right? Um, but when we start to look at all the different factors in someone's life, when we think about what their traumas might be, you know, their childhood experiences, the socioeconomic factors, their access to healthcare and other resources, um, we see that it's actually much more complex and so harm reduction is kind of looking at, well, what are these other factors going on? Can we advocate for, you know, cheaper housing? You know, can we, can we advocate for, um, you know, finding ways to keep our communities safe that don't rely on over-policing them? Um, and so when people have these different things in their lives, like housing, um, access to, to insurance and medical care, they're going to be much, much less likely to experience substance-related harm um, and substance use as well. So in addition to, to all of that, um, we need to think about how substance use is serving a function in someone's life. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the kind of fight, flight, freeze phenomenon, um, where when we experience something that, you know, triggers our nervous system. Sometimes we have this response to either fight it, to get out of there as quickly as possible, or just to freeze. Um, and there's a new one that's also fawn, so kind of like trying to um, appease whatever is causing the trigger. So substance use is really uniquely serving one of those functions for people or trying to kind of like numb those flight, flight, freeze responses. Um, and so maybe for some people using is kind of like, I just want a quick escape. Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to get home. I'm going to have, you know, have a drink, um, and just kind of, you know, escape my day. Um, some people might be using to numb, right? Maybe the things that they've experienced, whether that's recently or in their childhood are so horrific that they don't want to feel anymore. Um, 
maybe they want to kind of just like obliterate all of that. You know, they don't want to experience that. There's other ways that substance use can help people kind of, um, so that that was kind of more like the, the freeze response, right? Where we're shutting down, we're uh, flight, we're escaping. Um, and a fight response might look something like someone's using methamphetamine because they wanna be able to stay awake in dangerous situations. So I actually meet a lot of people who are living outside um, who use meth for that exact reason because they're scared, you know, they've dealt with, dangerous situations. They'd rather sleep during the day. Um, so they use meth so they can stay up at night. So when you think about it that way, um, for me, it kind of removes some of the stigma and shame attached to substance use. Um, so when we're looking at this whole kind of like complex system of things that are happening within someone's life, um, I don't need to blame the individual as much, right? Because there's a lot more happening. Um, and this is a different approach than the medical model of, of seeing it as an organic illness. Um, and for some people, it can be really helpful to say like, oh, wow, like it makes sense that this is something genetic, right? Like this is something that was kind of passed on. Like my, my parents dealt with this issue. Now I'm dealing with it. Um, but for some, it's kind of self-defeating to think of it as an organic illness. Um, cause it's like, well, then what do I even do with that. It's just part of who I am. Um, and also the medical model tends to lead us as a, society, a society to not look at how our culture, our various economic and government systems and ways of life are creating the very conditions that are causing trauma that leads to substance use and leads to the triggering of the biological you know, predispositions for substance use. That's kind of my, um, my soapbox. <laughs> but basically, what I think is that we really, we need both. We need a middle way. We need the medical model, looking at the organic illness, and we need the kind of more recovery model is what it's called, where we're looking at the context. Um, and one thing I really want to, um, uh, you know, put out there is that harm reduction is not saying that substance use is okay or that it's safe. It's just kind of acknowledging plainly that there is a risk for harm with substance use, as well as it being a calm experience amongst humans. And so let's have frank and even boring conversations about it so people can decide how they want to move forward um, with their substance use. And really, you know, when um, in this group that I do on the, the psych unit, what we end up talking about the most is like, focusing on people's quality of life. Like, what do you want? Like, what do you want in your life? What makes your life worth living? What is a good quality of life to you? Regardless of where they're at in their substance use and what they might do going forward with their substance use, what makes a good quality of life? Um, so some of the ways that we, we support people in increasing their quality of life is to really encourage safer use strategies. And that's kind of a cornerstone of harm reduction. And um, we talked a little bit about, about those, like you know, having a designated driver, counting your drinks, choosing to wait later in the day until drinking. Um, but there's all different kinds of things and we don't have enough time to get, to get into a ton. So I encourage you all to look into it. Um, but there's kind of this, this hierarchy of use where it's like maybe injection drug use, is kind of the most dangerous. There's like more risk for, you know, tissue damage, infection, um, transmission of disease. Um, and also depending on where you inject, you can, you, you can, you know, hit arteries and it can be really bad. Um, and then maybe a little like down below injecting is smoking. Um, so smoking drugs is a little bit safer than injecting drugs. Snorting is a little bit safer than smoking and injecting. And then ingesting is gonna be a little bit safer than the other ones. I do wanna say that using fentanyl, you can overdose with any of those um, modes of use. So there's other approaches with fentanyl too that we talk about. Um, how often you use, choosing never to use alone, carrying Narcan with you if you're someone who thinks, you know, I mean, I encourage everyone to um, carry Narcan, which is a overdose reversal drug. Um, 
So, but especially for folks who are in communities where people are actively using, please carry Narcan. Um, and there's ways to, to get it for free. Um, so, sorry, I'm kind of looking through my notes here. Um, so harm reduction, I think what we're doing here is that it's kind of breaking through this very black and white thinking that we have around substance use, that if, you know, it kind of needs to be all or nothing, where it's like, if we're going to, you know, have a safer, healthier life, you know, we just have to drop it. We have to totally drop the addiction. And for some people, that's going to work, right? And for some people, that can, that approach can be really helpful. Um, but uh, for harm reduction, um, we're saying that no matter where you're at, you're making choices, you have self-efficacy, you can make decisions about your life, and it kind of brings awareness to those choices and helps people feel like, okay, I can make a difference. Because for some folks, when they think about abstinence, it's such a barrier, you know, like it's just um, to think about completely dropping it, people sometimes just can't do it. But are there ways to reduce are there ways to do it safer? And also really employing the fact that you are worth it. Like you are worth, um, you know, choosing these healthier, healthier and safer ways. Um, so another thing that's interesting about it too is that it kind of, when we're able to have these open conversations about like, how do you want to use? Like, how do you want to change your use? It somewhat takes the romance out of it like we have in our culture, we have this very like another spectrum of like, so it's either romantic, uh, romanticization or vilification. And so it, you know, but when we can talk about it plainly, it really kind of opens up this realm of like it, of options. Um, and, uh, and also I think sometimes makes us kind of bored with the addiction anyways. Um, so it's kind of interesting that way. Um, I want to pause here before I kind of shift gears and talk about Dharma and harm reduction. I just want to see if there's any questions about kind of the substance use side of things um, or questions about harm reduction in general. I know I'm like um, throwing out a lot of information there, so. Jeff. I appreciate people listening. Patty, did you say something? Yes, I, I said I, I had a question. Okay. So um, I, I was wondering with this approach, like, um, do, does it happen where somebody who maybe um, uses this approach with harm reduction that 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 is makes it for maybe for the first time that they're able to consider quitting completely? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that actually happens quite a bit is that people will get started <clears throat> on a harm reduction approach of things and are able to see like, okay, like when I drink six beers instead of eight, I have less of a headache, you know, <laughs> like I feel a little bit better. And so it does, it kind of, for some people, it really starts this like cascade of positive change. So, you know, moving towards that, that positive direction. And we really, really, really want to encourage, you know, every single little step that people are making. So really jumping on those, like, wow, you drank six beers instead of eight. That's fantastic. Like really, really um, encouraging people. Hey, Jack, it's Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Uh, hi. Uh, I was curious because it's about speaking openly and frankly and honestly about the matter. How do you help people even consider the harm reduction model when their life situation is, in fact, hopeless? And that harm reduction, like, yeah, okay, so maybe it's going to make the effects of the, the the use a little bit not as bad but they're still whatever living out on the streets and having to deal with frightening situations at night and there's nothing that you can do about that how yeah. do you encourage and provide 
uh, some support motivation help them feel motivated to approach a harm reduction model when the situation that's causing them to want to use in the first place isn't going to go away. That's a fantastic question. Yeah, thanks so much for asking it. Um, so in in that situation, um, and you know, it's it's individual for for each person, but we kind of start by talking about like um, what has substance use done for you? Like what positive aspects you know has substance use brought to your life? Why are you using, you know? And so we start to, you know, kind of work together. Like instead of the counselor coming with, well, I see you're homeless. I see, you know, you're struggling with this and this. We let the person, we kind of guide a conversation of like, well, what is it that's been leading you to, to use and how is it working for you, you know? Um, and so really helping that person kind of map their world. And then, you know, asking the question too, like, what do you not like about your use? Like, what are some things that have not been going well because of your substance use? And so again, kind of like filling out that map a little bit more. And then people can start to work on like, okay, well maybe, you know, what's really a struggle right now is that I have to live outside and that sucks. But I also haven't been following up with my housing case manager. So I'm gonna like take a bus down there tomorrow, talk to her, you know, like get back on the housing list, right? So we start to just kind of work on these, um, these bigger goals in very small chunks. Because you're right, otherwise, like, it's overwhelming what people are going through. Um, so that's kind of in general, like encouraging people to map their world, and then find one thing that they want to start working on and chunking down into smaller chunks. I'm wondering what is your first point of contact? Sorry, can you say that again? What is your first point of contact? Yeah, I know that there are people that are in counseling and in you know the the centers, but there's got to be a point of contact outside of that. Um, so are you saying like where I uh, first see people? Well, I know you see people once they come to counseling, but how do you yeah. get outside? Yeah, um, well, a lot of people um, start counseling after they've had um, a crisis moment. Maybe they've been in the hospital for an overdose or a suicide attempt, um, and that's going to connect them to outpatient services. Um, so that's often where the folks who are living outside, where they're going to, you know, end up getting connected, it's oftentimes through experiencing a crisis, which is really unfortunate, right? Like we, we need to be better at preventative care. Um, and so there are actually, there's some programs out there that um, uh, do outreach folks um, in kind of unhoused communities and just see like, are you in need of services? Like, what kind of things do you need? What do you want? Um, and I think that's a really good model because we want to try and prevent this stuff, uh, you know, this kind of harm as much as possible. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, yeah. All right, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and um, talk a little bit about Dharma and harm reduction. Um, I want to propose the idea that all of us Dharma folks and practitioners, even those of us who are not currently experiencing active addiction, are in fact using harm reduction every day. Um, and in fact, as uh, uh, my friend and fellow Sangha member Connor pointed out to me a few weeks ago when we were talking about this, um, he said that actually the entire Buddhist path is in fact a harm reduction approach. So what's happening with us is that we are in the midst of harrowing addiction to our various afflictive states of mind, aren't we? You know, even if we have dedicated ourselves to the Buddhist path, the vast majority of us are on the gradual path. So that means that we're still reeling constantly from attachment to things that we crave, you know, whether sex, attention, and escape or yes, substances, 
um, aversion for things we hate, whether that's loss of affection, um, sometimes we hate other people, being cold or, you know, like our own bullshit, right? These are, these are things we have aversion for and ignorance to things that we are, you know, that are not centered on our narrow relative, you know, self view. Um, so coming to the Dharma center is that, you know, we we're becoming dissatisfied with all of this, right? It's a step in the direction towards positive change, but we're still actively engaging in all of the afflictions. We're just not as satisfied by them. They don't give us as much pleasure as we, you know, as we got before. Um, and we can no longer identify as much with, with those things. Um, and we're more aware of those things that we were once ignorant of. And it really sucks. <laughs> um, so we want to go back. It's almost like we want to go back to what it felt like, you know, um, before meeting the Dharma. But unfortunately, when things have gotten to the point of active, like uncontrolled addiction, they're no longer fun. And <laughs> this is, this is, you can disagree with me about all the other things that I've said today during this talk, but this is the one thing that you can't disagree with me on, okay? Is that people don't show up at a safe syringe needle exchange because life is good and everything's going great. <laughs> and one day they just decided to like get neck deep into injection drug use. Like that's not how it goes, right? <laughs> they're there because they're already addicted. Life is hard and they want like any shred, last shred of dignity and sanity. So similarly, people don't show up to the Dharma Center because things are going just fine. Like, did we? How did, I imagine many of us, how did many of us show up here? Things were hard. Things were frustrating. Things were unsatisfying. Um, so we're here because we've been caught up in this active and uncontrolled addiction to samsara. And the gradual path gives us these safer samsara use strategies, if you will, for engaging this world. Um, and since we haven't been able to find our way out of it, and we don't have, you know, the karmic fortune to just kind of, you know, have that rapid path, um, we have to have this gradual approach. Um, and just quickly, uh, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of, you know, the Lam Rim. <laughs> you know, the Lam Rim is huge, so I'm very much condensing. Um, but if you have a chance to look at the Tara practice, the green Tara practice sadhana that we have at the temple, I hope there's some lying around. But it has an excellent glance meditation on the graduated path, and I really recommend looking into it. So kind of like the low beginner capability um, on the path. So maybe like, you know, you're still addicted, you're still wanting to engage with samsara, but you want to do a little bit better. Um, it's we're starting to look at, OK, what are the four thoughts that turn the mind to dharma? You know, um, uh, life is is impermanent. Um, we have a precious human life. You know, we have everything we need um, to do this path. Um, but guess what? Our actions have consequences, and so we need to be mindful of them. Um, and also, samsara is just so unsatisfactory. So we're really steeping our minds in that. That's the kind of like starter state of this harm reduction approach to samsara. The middle capability, so that's like an even safer approach, um, is to decide, I actually don't want to be a part of this anymore. I want to maintain enlightenment. I want to be liberated. Um, so I'm going to train in higher conduct, wisdom, and meditation. Otherwise, I'm going to keep cycling through all of this. But then the, the higher capabilities, that's the, you know, the most safest on the path um, is, you know, the Mahayana Bodhisattva path. So the sutra path, we realize that, you know, um, all of these beings around me who were once my mothers, um, they're, they're all suffering. And in order to help them, which is what I want to do, I have to practice the six paramitas, generosity, ethical discipline, patience, joyful effort, meditative concentration, wisdom. And then even higher on the safer samsara youth strategies is the Vajrayana path. So here we recognize that other beings suffering is our own. And we vow to practice what our teacher has given us um, because we want to keep coming back um, to help free people. 
So we're learning how to function in samsara. We're learning how to become better at, you know, all this craziness um, to, to bring some peace in this chaos. Um, and we have a teacher who is a samsara harm reduction counselor um, of like, you know, just such incredible wealth and knowledge. Um, so really, really, you know, let's use what we have here. Like we, this precious human life is incredible. We have everything we need um, to do this. So yeah, let's do the path and every step that we take on it, let's rejoice in it. So thanks everybody. And I'm, I, I know we're up at 12 o'clock, but maybe we've got some time for discussion. Thank you so much, Jack. Sure. Sorry about the feedback. Um, I see, I see on the screen a chat. I don't know if you can see it, but thanks, everybody. Yeah, and even um, you know, I'm curious in the next few minutes if people are thinking of ways that they're using harm reduction in their daily life or practice. And yeah, Ellen, go ahead. Um, well, I don't have a good answer prepared to that question. And I don't really have a question, it's just an observation that during your talk, you know, I, I, I think, well, I don't work in this field. It's not really my life, it's super fascinating. Um, boy, I wish I could contribute more. And gosh, I really feel for those people that are caught in that cycle, um, but, it wasn't until you sort of related it to the Buddhist path that I realized I have sort of hold it like that's them and it's not me. Yeah. You know, that my life, I'm fine, right? I'm fine. And it's too bad they're in that camp, but I'm, you know, I'm not in that camp. But it's not true. You know, I have my own things. Um, so I think it's helpful to remember that. And my things might not be as in my face as theirs are for them physically, but they're still as hard to get out of, obviously, because I've been trying, you know, concertedly now for 15 years or so, and I haven't made much progress. So, yeah. boy, it makes you realize that um, we all have our things, don't we? We sure do. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, a really important part is to remember that, you know, um, we're dealing with it too. You know, it's not just those people out there. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Dirk. I'm sorry I got here late. Uh, but still, I think I... Uh, I didn't want to talk about this, but but I think I think in the context, I, I probably should. I, uh, you know, I, I lived in... I arrived in New York City in uh, early 1978 with the one-way ticket and I didn't know anyone. I got robbed and I lived in abandoned buildings uh, on the street uh, with a pretty bad head injury, pretty active still. Uh, and I was so overwhelmed I couldn't, people couldn't understand me when I spoke to them. Uh, so, you know, the, the people you're talking about, I, I'm, I'm one of them. Um, And your 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 course of harm reduction is exactly. Uh, I I wasn't exactly addicted to drugs or anything, but I I had other problems. Uh, but but still, the the first thing that worked for me was just going into a being able to go in out of the cold, in 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 uh, the winter in New York City and uh sit and have a cup of, of coffee yeah. even though people i would try to talk to people and they wouldn't understand they couldn't understand what i was saying to them i was like a um and then and then one guy saw that i was reading rilke because I, I could still think it wasn't like my mind was gone i was still pretty much the way i am now but i i, I was so overwhelmed I, I i my my mind and my speech weren't connected so uh one guy saw that I was reading Rilke and suddenly I became human to him and mm -hmm. everything changed. Just having that one human contact 
yeah. with a uh, sane person. And so now fast forwarding, I, I look at what you're talking about and that whole thing, it's, it's interesting that this Buddhist concept of aspiration um, is really at the heart that that that's sort of at the heart of how that works i think it's just mm -hmm. if, if you can have a glimmer of aspiration for something uh you can go a long ways on that um uh, yeah uh johnny uh chensei lodro uh talks about if you can't do anything else just offer a flower to the buddhas and bodhisattvas mm -hmm. and that that like that kind of a, just a, the, the smallest, just the smallest act can make just a, a tremendous difference. Anyway, thank, thank you for your talk. Thanks so much, Jerk. Yeah, and for your, um, your story and that reminder that like just the simplest human connection of like, let's have a coffee and just, you know, share what we like about a book. That is, so powerful right especially if like you know someone's been shunned um by maybe you know everyone family friends society you know um just that human connection is so um so powerful um yeah thank you any other thoughts or as we wrap up I think I think uh, I, I can speak for everyone when I say thank you. Thank you. Yeah, much appreciated. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, um, what is dedication? Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chen Mizig Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, and make requests at your holy feet. So uh, we, we have a couple of announcements. I have one, and then um, maybe some friends here have one or two. But my, my announcement is that next Friday we have expressions and um, if you are free on Friday, that'd be wonderful for you to join us and maybe even bring something to eat, to share. That we offer and to our to our Look, to Susan is here. I'm going to ask if she could say something about Ling Rinpoche. Um, next weekend is on Saturday is um, the uh, DELIC meeting, the meeting of people who are interested in um, learning about um, being of service and being helpers. Um, we will be meeting from, I think it's 11 to, no, it's 11.30 to, thank you, yeah, 11.30 to 12.45, so bring a lunch, or if you like, or something to share, um, there'll be, I'll probably bring some cookies anyway, um, and basically, it's just going to be sort of a roundtable discussion 
about these two chapters in a book that we're recommending, that Lama's recommending, that we read called um, No Time to Lose, which is a Pema Chodron book, um, a commentary on the Bodhisattva way of life. So the first couple of chapters are about aspiration and about bodhicitta. So we'll be talking about that and about um, leading into the six paramitas. And then following that, if you can stay around, it would be really worthwhile Lama's having a Sangha meeting. So there'll be a Sangha meeting at one o'clock next Saturday. So that's also a time to meet people and to find out information that you didn't know before, and you never know what's going to pop up. Mama is always surprising. So, and he may be able to come to the Delic meeting too, I'm hoping. I, I forgot about the I forgot about the Dalek meeting. That's super important. So I just want to let people know that we're going to kind of blast out to the uh, Dharma centers throughout California later this week. And when we do that, um, there might be it might be a big crowd here for Ling Rinpoche, the for, a reincarnation of the Dalai Lama's former tutor. And so if um, we we have unlimited online. Uh, registration, but you have to register to be able to see it, to see Ling Rinpoche give a teaching on Manjushri's very special. And um, But if you'd like to attend, please please uh, go to our website and look under the tab, What's New, and you'll see uh, access to the form to fill out. Thank you. Oh, and then also, uh, I've been reminded here that there's a men's group that's going to meet after this after this uh, meeting. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon with friends and family or with yourself. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Betty. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Oh,